So we'll begin by importing an OBJ file into the ZBrush session here. I'm going to bring in the base model, which is the full body male.obj file that's available from Pixelogic. It's also in the support files for this class. And it's just a general full body mesh, just a generic body. I'm going to go into the basic material, gray, so we can take a look at this. So I just like working from a very basic, uh, you know, fundamental model to start with. First thing that we want to do is just prep this for sculpting. If we go into frame mode here, with Shift F, you can see that there's no polygroups on this model. I'm going to use transpose masking here, make sure that my X symmetry is turned on. I'm going to use transpose masking to polygroup based on masking. So now you can see we've got the arms polygrouped. Clear that mask, and I'll do the same for the legs now. And we'll do the same for the head. There we go. It's not perfect. You know, there's a few missed faces here and there, but it's actually not something I'm too worried about. The back there, I want to. I just noticed that we we got uh, we caught the back in our group. So I'm going to poly group from masking there. Oops. Let's mask there. I'm going to go to visibility, hide point. There we go. Now I'll just group visible. Just to clean up that poly group. There we go. I'm going to click group visible again just so I get a, a different color. That was a little too close to the other color. Group visible on the head. So we've got the head, the arms, and then we'll go back and mask down to the legs again. I'll sharpen that mask. I'll leave the buttocks in there and I will polygroup from masking. There we go. That's what we need. I'll save my work now. I'll save it as a Z tool. We'll call this creature 001. I always try and save with a three digit extension and save often since eventually you're going to run into an experience where it crashes and corrupts and you just want to make sure that you can bounce back to an earlier file version. I'm going to go ahead and divide once with Control D and I'm going to lower these arms using transpose bringing the arms down a bit actually I'm going to unmask this area and let's lower the shoulders a bit there we go Mm, not quite. Let's unmask here. And there we go. Just going to bring these down a bit. Just going to make sure that we get all that masked out. There we go. Lower the arms. Doesn't really have to be perfect, but I don't want it to be too messy. So let's bring it down again. There we go. Now I use move, bring those down. There we go. Actually, I'm going to undo that. Drag this transpose line here inside the arm. I'm going to unmask a bit of the shoulder here. Control click to feather that. And let's bend these arms forward, rotate these arms forward. And while I'm here I'll rotate them back since I know I'm going to be rotating them back anyway. Great. Clear our mask. Go in with the clay tubes brush. I have all of my brushes hotkeyed. My brush hotkeys are, are one for move, two for standard, three for inflate, and four for clay tubes. So you'll see these brushes here changing. And I'll mention as I change brushes, but you're not going to see me come up here to the menu and change brushes because it's just not how I work. And I really, really highly recommend 
that you set hotkeys and, and do the same because it'll it'll increase your speed immensely. So this character I know is a, a necromancer type figure. Some kind of necro magician. So I, I want to give him some long features here. I'm lengthening the neck to an absurd degree. I think that this uh the image that I have in my mind is a very surreal, surreal creature. Maybe he was human at a time, but not anymore. And I see him as very long and attenuated. We're going to polygroup the face as well in a little bit, but I'm going to start suggesting some cheekbones here. He's going to have a very cadaverous look to him. Going in with the standard brush, just carving out a couple hollows here. Stepping down, I'm going to wipe back that face. I don't want that face to be influencing my work too much. Going in with the move brush now, and I want to bring down this shape here. I don't want the trapezius quite so pronounced, I don't think. And I'm going to bring out but the bony landmarks there at the shoulder. And I'm going to bring the hollow right here. This is called the infraclavicular fossa. And it just helps define the deltoid from the front. I'm bringing that in. It's a little hollow that's underneath the, uh, uh, the clavicle, which is why it's called the infraclavicular fossa. That's just a fancy Latin for um, hole underneath the clavicle. So... <laughs> What's usually, what's pretty much always the case with the anatomical terms are it's just something really plain and simple, it just happens to be in Latin. In my anatomy book, though, I do recommend that you learn the names of things. I think it's valuable, especially if you happen to be amongst people who also have that terminology. When artists can share that that vocabulary, I think it's really powerful because you're able to communicate things very specifically to each other. You're able to say, for example, uh, I think that the external oblique on this character is inserting in the wrong place. Instead of, you know that sort of muscle pad thing on the side right there? I think the upper part of that's in the wrong spot. You're able to really specifically say right here, the external oblique needs to... Um, needs to originate higher. You need to play with where that that uh, or point of origin is and maybe uh, the compression when it flows over the uh, um, iliac crest here, the pelvis. You know, you can be really specific. It doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to be showing off or anything, but I have been in, in work situations where the other artists I'm working with did have a shared anatomical vocabulary and we were able to really communicate things clearly and it was fun too because I think that having a name for something gives you a, a place in your mind to sort of store that information so uh, just as a mnemonic device when I'm working I try and maintain the lowest possible subdivision level so you'll notice that I'll work often you know down here at level one or level two the rule of thumb that I use is I'll, I'll try and make a shape at the lowest possible subdivision level that will actually support the shape. So if I can get it from you know a lower subdivision level, if I can make the form that I need, I'll try and do that. So I usually find that stepping up, you know, too early just creates problems. It makes things lumpy, gives you too much to have to deal with. So I'm going to lengthen the face a little bit here. We're going to need to come in here and polygroup the face in a little bit. There's some tools now that will allow you to um, to work on the model. Uh, use the move brush to separate the lips, for example. If we go to the, uh, the brush menu with the B hotkey, M as in move. There is move topological. Oops. Uh, right there. So if I select move topological, it tries to grab the points that are topologically close to one another so you can do things like separating lips but I still find that it's it's easier for me to just use the regular move brush and use polygroups to separate these things out so I'm just cutting in just a few little 
shadow points here. And we'll revisit this later. I envision this to be sort of a almost like a mummified figure, but alive. So I've done some thumbnails and given some thought to this, so I fully expect that it'll go through some changes as I work on it, though. Things always do. It's mo the most fun when things are evolving while you're working on them. Otherwise, you're just reproducing. You're just photocopying, which tends not to be all that interesting, except as maybe a, an exercise in sculpting, an exercise in, in reproducing a form from a drawing or a photo. But I really like the, the process of, of watching something evolve as I work on it. So, actually even though that's not necessarily an accurate place for that hollow, I kind of like the way that looks. So, you'll notice I'm just kind of, I look like I'm just going in and just making little indentations, and what I'm trying to do is just catch shadow in certain areas. I'm just looking for places where I can, you know, uh, give the impression of there being, you know, bone and sinew and, you know, uh, muscles dipping in deeper into the body. I'm going to go in with the clay tubes brush. Here's a good example of an area, and I'm going to change the basic material too. Here's a good example of an area where I'm trying to get this pectoralis muscle out of the form here, using the lowest possible subdivision level to do it. And I don't want to build up that pectoralis too much. I really don't want that to become a bulky shape. I just want to give the um, clamshell flint, um, feathering out of those muscle striations from the head of the humerus towards the sternum. There we are. <clears throat> My composition for this figure is portrait. It's cropped into about here. So I'm not too worried about anything below the waist. So you're, probably, you're not going to see me fuss too much with those areas. So here I'm starting to think about the rib cage. Going with the move brush, and I want to peek this rib cage out a bit. this in so we get that egg form to the ribs. I uh, don't want to tuck that in too much. I want to create something like that. I'm going to step down my subdivision levels here and you can see how I'm going to be able to very quickly dial in this rib cage shape from here. This is all I need in terms of subdivision levels to get this form. There is a certain shape here to the rib cage that I want to establish. There's a a crest or a high point through about this point where it tapers down. I just want to get that get that across here. And there we go. I'm gonna go back in with clay tubes, step up a subdivision level, and bring these obliques back in. Even though we're not going to be down this low, I do want them in there just because it makes it difficult to consider the, the sculpture as a whole if you know, part of it's just hanging out unfinished and wrong. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch the sculpture down to the waist and I'll probably hide those parts. Oops. I've hidden the arms and the head now just so I can work on the torso. And take out some of that mass. I really want him to feel skinny and tense. Attenuated really is the really the word for it. I want him to feel like there's a lot of tension in this body. Turn down the intensity on the smooth brush, knock this back.
Make sure you turn perspective on and off while you work. I'm going to save my work. Remember to save in iterations. Now you can save uh, either Z tools or you can save projects. In this case, I really. Pixel Logic wants you to start saving projects. I'm just in the habit of saving Z tools. And if I'm not texturing, if I'm only sculpting and I'm working on a single Z tool, I'll usually just save a Z tool. But if I'm working with more than one object and I've got a pretty complex sculpting and texturing session going, I might start saving projects here under the file menu. So it's, uh, it's a matter of preference. I th I do think it's probably best to get in the habit of saving projects, though, because it will save everything that you have open in ZBrush at that time. So you can't really go wrong saving a project. Whereas if you just save a Z tool and it turns out there's something that you had open, an alpha or a texture that you want, or a subtool that you know, or a different Z tool you're working with at the same time, it'll save in a project file. Everything that's open in the tool menu, for example, will save in a project file. Alright, let's go ahead and polygroup this face. I'm going to go to Morph Target and st click Store Morph Target, the store copy of this face in memory. Now I'm going to smooth the mouth open. So that'll separate the lips. I'll go to the brush menu and I'll select the Select Lasso. So now what I'll get is this, this Lasso Selection tool. I'm going to zoom in and I'm going to drag a lasso around the lower jaw just like this and then I will go to group visible reveal all and then I will switch the morph target back so it restores the shape of the mouth usually I'll actually polygroup ears as well but this character is not going to have uh, very well defined ears they're going to be shriveled up a bit and shrunken down the eyes a bit. If you want to create kind of a otherworldly, otherworldly sense to something, just a, something that's uncanny, play with the placement and the shape of the eyes. Just subtly shift them out of, out of whack. Spacing them out just a little too far helps. But it's a fine line because you can very, very quickly go from being uncanny to just looking wrong or looking like a mistake. So the trick is to you know find these these considerations these sort of design decisions that that don't look like their mistakes they look like they fit with the figure they they they're successful if they you know create an interesting figure that looks uncanny rather than you know what the heck's wrong with that thing are those eyes too close together for example I'm going to I might take his nose away. I'm not going to carve that nose away just yet, but I, I'm going to leave it smoothed down a bit. And I do know that I'm going to have a grin on him, so I'm going to start shifting the, the mouth back. So eventually we'll need to bring a subtool in there. I'm going to use some teeth that um, were made by a friend of mine named Jim McPherson that I included in my first book, ZBrush Character Creation. It's just a really great model of teeth and I've used them consistently for a long time. Think about raising the dome of the head a bit. And I want to give the chin an acuteness. By that, I just want this angle to be acute. I want it to be you know, much more um, extreme than what it was.
Often when you're sculpting, it pays to look at your model from unique perspectives. For example, here I'm looking at it from the top down, which helps me spot areas where I should pull the bone structure out or push it in. to drag a transpose line down to the waist here. And I think I'm actually going to lengthen this body a little bit. And I know I'm not going to be showing the hips here, but I don't like the pear shape he was taking on, so I'm trying to narrow those hips a bit. They were looking uh, rather feminine, so I wanted to take that back a bit. Turn down the intensity on that smooth brush and smooth back that form there in the belly. And now stepping back up the subdivision levels, and we'll save our work. So I'm appending these teeth in here. This model, this teeth model, um, is created by Jim McPherson. I'm going to use transpose to move them down where the body is. Let's focus in here. Obviously, these need to be scaled down and rotated. I'm going to turn off perspective mode. Go into rotate, transpose, rotate, and holding down shift, I just rotate them around 180 degrees and then scale them down. And then using move, I'll shift them up into the head. If you hold down shift while you do the transpose line, it will actually snap, conform to the, uh, to the axis that you're dragging along. That's annoying. It keeps snapping back. I don't know why it's snapping back to view like that. That's very annoying. Scale this back down. ZBrush can be a little bit buggy. I'm going to turn on transparency mode. Use the move transpose to bring these teeth forward. I really want to stretch the lips over these teeth. Okay, and I'm going to use the move brush. I'm actually going to use a different move brush. I'm going to go to move, and there's one called move parts right here. This one's cool because it will only move the part you click on. So something like these teeth that has multiple parts, if I click just on the gums, it's only going to move the gums. So turn on Xsymmetry here and I can stretch these gums down because I've got the feeling I'm going to be exposing a lot of the gums here. Go 
I'll turn on turn off transparency mode and I will alt click on the body to switch to that go into move mode and I'm just gonna pull the lips out and back I want to start to suggest these are stretched over the the teeth and gums control shift click on the lower jaw will isolate that so I can mask it I want this guy to have a leering a leering kind of grin really disturbing smirk like he knows something and whatever a guy that looks like this knows is not good bring out these cheeks a bit step down subdivision levels I'm going to smooth this back step up let me increase the intensity of my smooth a little bit smooth that back and use move I'm going to bring these back in because if he's that desiccated it's not he's probably not going to have that because if you, if you do that if you grin like that and look in the mirror you'll see how it sort of pulls your cheeks away from your um, from your teeth but this guy has got kind of a mummified thing going on this grin is you know partially a grin and partly like rictus where the facial muscles are are uh, contracting so that's really gonna stretch I want it to feel like it's stretched over the teeth there which is why I'm really trying to pull those teeth out I'm kind of alt clicking on those teeth now because I want to pull these forward and really pull that maxilla out. I want the silhouette to break out of the the teeth or out of the lips there, so it really does feel like his skin is pulled back and his skull is jutting out. Alt click on the body and return you to that subtool selection. Just actually, I don't want to bunch the teeth together quite so much like that. I'm going to undo that a little bit. There we go. I'm going back in with the clay tubes brush now. Just changing, adding a bit of subtlety to the skull here.
lost the bridge of the nose here. It's occurring to me that something was wrong. And it's that. It's the nasal bone is gone. So I'm bringing that nasal bone out. Bring the jawline back a bit. And just for fun, at this point, I am a, I'm going to play a little bit with the idea of this guy having ears. I might get rid of them. I'll probably lose them. But just pulling them out at this point adds this weird, goofy creepiness to him. So, I'll leave those there for right now. I'm thinking that he's going to have more of a regal appearance when it's done. I'm going to add a bit of a headdress uh, sort of regalia to him. And I don't know that the ears are really going to serve any purpose making him feel regal. But you never know. Uh, for right now, they're, they're pretty interesting. And they are going to kind of help me judge the head because it's really hard to work a head with no ears. So, I'm going to bring these cheekbones out. And here you'll notice again I'm working at a really low subdivision level and right now I'm actually changing the line of the zygomatic bone here at the lowest subdivision level but if I step up you see that zigzag translates all the way across thinking about this plane change here Use the move brush to slide these forehead forms together. I like the idea of him having this sort of maniacal look on his face. S somehow creepier and cooler than just the usual snarling, malicious intent. Something a bit more mysterious about something that appears more maniacal. experiment really quickly with masking this out up here and seeing what it's like if I bring this down oops that's not gonna work I'll just manually move this down And we'll go to the teeth, and I'll scoot these down with the move brush. There, I like that extra length in the head. Make sure that I don't want to bring these out even further. I think I do, because that really does make those lips, makes the lips and the skin feel peeled back. And if you look, if his cheekbone is here, I can, I can justify his teeth being this far out as well. So I'll alt-click on the body. And it just switches my subtool over. I'm going to go into transparency mode just so I can see the lips easier. And I just want to bring these lips right up to the surface. I don't want to pucker them out too much. I'll just bring these forward a bit. I like the idea of showing a lot of gum here. Let's see what happens if I bring this way up. It becomes a bit more smirky and snarly. Oh, that's creepy. I'm going to go in with the inflate brush really quickly. That's my number three hotkey. And I want to kind of mass out these lips again because I'm losing a lot of body in these lips. Let's leave that right there. And I'm going to leave the head for a little while, go back to the rest of the torso. Pick out some more shadow here through the neck. I lie.
died. I'm coming back to the head. Oh, that's just wonderfully disturbing right there. Let's do that. Let's pull that really far back. But by doing that, I'm going to create some kind of interesting problems here with the relationship, the cheekbone, because by all rights, the muscles pulling the, the mouth back that far are actually attaching here. So I'm going to have to play around with you know, some creative work here and here, unless I undo and maybe shift the cheekbones back a little bit. It almost looks like a hyena. I'm going to mask out the head. feather the mask by control clicking. Now I'm going to use transpose scale to play around with the shape or the size of the head. If I make the head bigger, he's going to look more like a child. If I make the head smaller, he's going to make his body look even more massive. That's interesting. It's very interesting there that that scale change between the body and the head. That just subtle making the head smaller makes him feel taller. So I'm going to stay with that. It also further others him by making the head smaller like that. It takes him just further, even further away from a normal human. Bring that jaw forward. And again, looking at it from underneath, just to make sure that I'm getting getting the depth in there. I don't want things to flatten out because I'm not really look at, looking at them from above, and that can happen really quickly in 3D. Or even in clay, if you're looking at something from the same angle all day and not moving it, or the same angles, you, know, you, you want to try and ch change, change up your view as much as you can. We're all guilty of not moving around as much as we should. Just always try and keep rotating around the sculpture and looking at it from from unique points of view that you might not have used recently, and it'll just help you keep everything clear in your head. That neck feels weird, a little weird to me from the side there. I'm gonna go with the move. <laughs> well, that's obvious.
obviously not where I want to go with that. Bring the base of the skull. You're never going to see the base of his skull, but it's bugging me. I'm going to fix that. So we're moving into time lapse at this point, just so we can quickly cover some more ground. So I'm isolating the torso and working the back of the rib cage here. I'm just sketching up where the rib cage turns up and into the center of the back. And now working into the armpits and suggesting the latissimus dorsi. And now the ribs. And widening the thoracic arch. It's the arch of the rib cage. And I'll use the standard brush here to sketch in the shapes of the muscles of the arm. It's the bicep there that I was sketching in. And I won't try and take those to a finish. It's really important to know that <clears throat> when I'm working, I'll touch an area and then quickly move on to the next one. I try to never get stuck in one place too long. For example, I wouldn't get stuck on the bicep trying to make a fully finished bicep or an upper arm. I want to move around the model working all the parts at the same time. That way it all comes up together. It's all at the same level of finish so it all feels consistent. And often if you you know work one area too long it just doesn't fit with the areas around it anymore. And the way I work and the way a lot of the sculptors I know work is they'll work in big strokes, big uh, sweeping forms, and work across the figure and then work in smaller and smaller areas, more more detail until it's done. So you're basically working your way around and down, um, if that makes sense. <clears throat> trying to, to work your way around the figure, working in, in more and more detail as you go. Um, rather than just trying to work one piece, get it to a fine finish, and then go on to the next piece. So right now I'm actually working the gesture of the body here. You notice that I was using the transpose rotate to just add some arch to the back. And sketching in the abdominal muscles now using the clay tubes brush. I do a lot of form sculpting with the clay tubes brush. I really like the effect that it has on the surface. It's very loose, very gestural brush. suggesting a navel there and bringing the abdominal muscles down from the ribcage. And now using transpose to enlarge the hands. Since this guy is so long, <clears throat> since his proportion is so extended, uh, the hands need to be big. Something interesting about hands too is if you're ever in doubt about the hands, make them bigger. Because invariably if if the hands on a fish on a figure are too small it looks like a mistake if the hands are too big it looks like it's a stylistic choice it's just one of those little things when in doubt make the hands and feet bigger the you know, upside of that is nine times out of ten they're too small anyway so So now we're going to go in with the clay tubes brush and start to continue to work the form of the arm, building up the bicep, and then coming down to the forearm, and we'll work the extensors here that roll around the forearm, starting to suggest that shape, and then the flexors that mass out the underside of the forearm. Then we'll turn towards the back and start to bring the deltoid uh, up to the the scapula there. And now I'm, I'm suggesting the scapula just by s picking out little bits of shadow around it. I don't have to, to you know, draw a, a, a recess around the whole scapula. I'm just going to catch shadows and key points around that bone and muscle structure there. I'm going to catch some shadow here under the deltoid. 
where it rolls up towards the, the spine of the scapula. And now I'm using the move brush to pull those shoulder blades out to give that nice sharp delineation there on the back. You'll see that if you Google you know, extreme thin, you'll see those, those shoulder blades floating under the skin and just being looking like very sharp little bones there. So adding a subdivision level now so we can get some more detail. Isolating the, the legs. Don't want to be distracted by those since we're really not going to use them. So at this point I'll just continue to pick out areas of shadow. And sometimes when you want to pick out a shadow, you don't have to deepen what's there. You might just want to raise what's next to it, like I just did with that deltoid. So you know, shadows are cast by the height of what's next to the shadow. So don't always feel like you need to push things in because sometimes, you know, you can carve things in too deep. Sometimes you just want to raise what's next to it.